I'm just a friend of Jim's. <laughs> uh, I'm up here because so we can uh, keep Deacon Rokas from coming up here and grabbing the microphone. Is that <laughs> right? <I'm sure. laughs> um, my children and Jim's children uh, went to school together and played on a lot of sports teams together. And this goes with Jim and Pat. Pat taught us at the baseball games how to keep score when there's no scoreboard. We were all instructed to go find twigs, dandelions, and rocks. And Pat made a scoreboard on the ground, and the dandelions were runs, and the rocks were how many outs there were. And there were like four of us sitting in, in lawn chairs. There was my wife and I, Pat, and another lady named Terry Downs. And the fifth person was Jim, but he couldn't sit. He had to pace. <laughs> and he walked around, and as the score got either worse or something, the pacing got faster. And then if either Chris or Tim came in to pitch, he added groaning to the pacing. <laughs> and as we sat there, he was always walking behind us, you know, and, and oh, Tim would throw a pitch and it was ball one and oh, you could hear him holding his stomach and, you know, and, and moaning. So what I'm getting to is later on the season, we played a baseball game over at Gray's Lake. And in Gray's Lake, they have two diamonds that are back to back. And on the varsity diamond, my one son was pitching. And then I noticed on the first soft diamond, my other son was pitching. So it was going to be a long day. I knew that right away. I moved down away from the where we usually sit, and I was standing there so I could watch one pitch over here, and then I could go back over here, and I was like an owl the whole day going back and forth. And at one point, uh, I looked over the varsity diamond, and my son just gave up a three-run homer to Gray's Lake. And as I glanced over in the sophomore diamond, my other son just gave up a two-run homer to <laughs> Gray's Lake. And as I stood there and I kind of was moaning and pawing the ground looking down all of a sudden a hand comes up to my shoulder and Jim goes you know it helps if you hold your stomach and moan and you know, so, <laughs> so I thought you know, he's a quiet guy but they're sneaky those wallows you know that's a sense of humor but, uh, uh, that's about it but later on we uh, kids go out of school and stuff in the last five years, I started working for the hospital as a driver, and we pick up patients, bring them into the hospital, and I started seeing Jim two or three times a week. And we would come to the front door, and I always thought, I, you know, I read the brochure here today, and there were so many things, memories. His laugh was distinctive. But what was even better was when he tried to hide the laugh. <laughs> you know, that little, little head back, and he's trying to stifle that laugh. So I thought it was my job, when I brought the patient into the front door and Jim came out to help, it was my job to make Jim laugh or embarrass him as much as I could. So I would be helping some elderly person in and Jim would come out, all smiles, and, and I would say, well, this is my twin brother Jim, you know, or this is a, the person would go, well, is that your brother? Does he drive too? And I, I'd say, no. Jim just got out of prison, and he doesn't want to go And he all the color just go right out. Oh, my gosh. And then, after we get the person situated, I come back out, and he goes, well, why do you tell people that? And then, he start to laugh, but he pulled the stuff at you as he was doing it. Uh, we used to spend the days that after, after you drop the patient off, you've got like five or ten minutes before they come back out. I would sit on, there's a bench out in front of the Woodstock Hospital. And we would sit there and talk about stuff for the 15, 20 minutes. And we'd start out talking about our kids and how we could help them. And then we realized that they're beyond help, you know? I mean, <laughs> there's no help for the law of the family anymore. The family. They didn't listen then, they don't listen now. So we quickly moved on to sports. And we couldn't talk about the Cubs or the, the Bears and the Packers because I'm a huge Bears fan and Jim is not. And so the conversations quickly came down to, well, we have Aaron Rodgers. 
and I just, well, we have nothing, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> we went on to uh, fixing the Cubs. We were good at that. But uh, I'll miss sitting on that bench talking to him. Um, I hope that in the afterlife there, I can see him one day to continue our conversations, but I have a lot of work to do to get there. <laughs> if I come on Deacon Rokas or Father Lipinski to put in a good word for me, I don't think that carries much weight anymore than you know, what it used to. So. Uh, I'll just try to be a better person, like everybody was talking about. He had an infectious smile, a smile that was... When he came out, that was genuine, and that he was a friend of yours, and I'll uh, miss that smile. So, thanks for listening. You know, you, you said at the beginning that you were, you know, no, I, it's a true story, I believe the family knows. My dad came and went different days. He was better and he was worse, and I, I do remember the one of the first times Mr. Winkleman there came by. Dad was having a terrible day. He didn't want to see anybody, but when Larry Winkleman came to the door, he immediately perked up and waved him in, and the rest of the afternoon was great. So, weren't you really one of his closest friends, and uh, you really made him smile. You really made him smile. So, thank you. Anyone else? Is anyone else here? Here you go. I had alluded to this, this story about the Stillman Valley game, I thought maybe I should for Mr. Pulaski's uh, benefit here, um, give him the full story of what really happened that day. Um, that was your IC game a year ago. Um, so I fall, just for one second. Yeah, I can probably, you can probably hear me. IC is one of those Catholic schools that doesn't yeah. play by the rules, I just wanted to play <laughs> coming. I hadn't spoke to him. I thought I was going to be working in the field that day. So he had no idea that I was coming. So I got into the game about five minutes before kickoff. And uh, I texted Heather. Heather stood up in the stands, pointed Dad out where he was in the stands. So he was in his usual pose of, of all curled up with his hood forward and rocking for the, the kickoff. So I just walked up, up the bleacher, sat next to him, Brad. And I just put my hand on his shoulder and said, I'm here, Dad. And I sat down. So the entire first half, Dad rocked. And at halftime, now, those that might not know, Dad had gone basically blind in his right eye. And I hadn't thought about it, but I'm sitting on his right-hand side. And at halftime, he turns to me and he says, so where are you here from? <laughs> and I said, no, I came down from Heber. And he says, really? He says, uh... I have a son that lives in Utah. I said, no kidding. He says, I said, uh, my dad lived in Hebron until about 10 years ago. He says, no kidding, I lived in Hebron. <laughs> then he fully turned and saw who I was, and that, that, will, that will forever stick <laughs> That's hysterical. <laughs> There's never going to be anybody more into a game than Dad. So I'm a, uh, a nephew, uh, Steve, and small memories, small memories. Uh, one of them, Maria, remind me of, uh, he drive that old farm ball M and uh, have all five kids latch to it uh, and come down to our yard. And uh, uh, one, he was also my uh, first baseball coach. And he was a great coach. Uh, he had that uh, patience and firmness all at once and, um, uh, as a coach, and that was awesome. Um, and the, one of my, I guess my memory is just kind of something that I've been thinking about is uh, anytime we went up to their yard, we drove up there, and they came down to ours, um, and you grandkids are probably 
would know this too. He always asked about you. You know, as a little kid, he's always asking about you and how you're doing and what's going on. He didn't just ignore you, but and just talk to the adults. That that was the way he was. You know, um, one little funny story is um, is simply this, and anybody in Hebron knows it's true that I don't think he ever drove his pickup over 40 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, Steve was talking about being a coach, and he really was. He was a great, great coach and one of the best minds that I think was in coaching. But, you know, he said, you know, good but firm. What Steve didn't know was uh, when you played for him as his son, it was a little different deal. Uh, particularly in Little League, I was, I, I, I was the catcher, and as he would hit infield, if anybody missed the ball, the next one he hit even harder to the next kid, so then they would miss one. But somehow it was my fault as the catcher that the guys out in the field were missing the ball. He got angrier and angrier, but never at the other kids, only at his own son catching, who hadn't actually dropped the ball in the first place. But yeah, he was a very, very intense little league coach in his own way, uh, for sure. Is there anybody else? Anybody else here? Logan. Talk. Michael. Logan, you want to say something? Um, Uh, one memory that I'll never forget, uh, Papa, and, uh, the second to last time I saw him, uh, he wasn't doing so well, and when I came in, I gave him my, uh, Packers polo case. I knew that I'd help him sleep more peacefully, and then he kind of went like this, pulled my head down by his and kissed me right here. So that's one memory I'll never forget of him. <laughs>